Good day, everyone. Welcome back to a new session here on the Shift Network Sound Healing Summit. We always appreciate having you with us. Our special guest coming up this time around is Ruchi Celli. Ruchi Maknai, who performs under the name Ruchi Celli, is an international touring, classically trained musician originally from Israel. Her career includes over 30 years of multi-genre performances on the cello and the publication of soulful chill-out music productions, as well as founding Intimate Cello, an art and a platform for channeled live compositions in the tuning system of A432 Hertz. Rudy, welcome. Thank you. Right Thank on. you for Quite, having me. <laughs> yeah, pleasure to have you here. I've been, I've been enjoying your videos on your YouTube channel, uh, the your various performances and recordings, and and looking forward to hearing having a chance to hear a little more of your sounds here in a few minutes. But um, you know, let's begin with the spoken word part. Uh, as I see, you've already had a prolific career as a performer and music creator. So just to get us rolling, maybe tell us a little bit more about your musical journey and how it evolved into some of the newer offerings that you're putting out now. Sure. Well, first of all, as you can hear, I have a bit of an accent. I was born in Israel. And I was uh, in a family full of musicians. I grew up into beautiful reality of lots of creativity. I started playing the cello when I was eight. And I enjoyed playing chamber music pretty much from the very beginning. So I got into the joy of performance from about eight or nine years old. And I went into music schools, both uh, junior high and high school in Israel, where I got a chance to play chamber music, to study composition, to study theory, to study history of music, and to also improvise, which is one of the areas that my soul always thrived, always enjoyed, and always um, had fun. And then right after high school, I actually went to the Tel Aviv Academy. I had a little murmur in my heart that basically eased me into the academic life rather than into the army, because in Israel it's uh, mandatory. But it was actually very gracefully given to me the opportunity to go to school. And so I went to study cello at the Tel Aviv University right after school and this is after i've studied with incredible teachers one of my te my favorite teachers was michael aran in tel aviv he was the principal cellist of the israel philharmonic orchestra and after him i studied with hillel sorry with whom i really enjoyed uh, tapping into the beauty of the cello and the repertoire of the cello and I was um, in my, I was very much in love with this beautiful violinist uh, in the end of high school who got a scholarship to study in the U.S. And he started inspiring me with this idea of moving to the U.S. as, mo as the motion to expand and also to learn and to, you know, have an adventure in life. And so I started putting that idea into my into my consciousness quite early. And so in the second year of studying at the Tel Aviv uh, Academy of Music, I also went to audition for a wonderful orchestra festival and it's called the Tanglewood uh, Music Festival that's connected to the Boston Symphony Orchestra. And so it was a really beautiful thing for me to actually come to the U.S. to audition. And at the same time I did the audition for that, I also did the audition for the New England Conservatory of Music with Professor Lawrence Lesser, who studied with a very famous cellist who was in Hollywood in the 40s and the 50s. His name is Piatigorsky, Gorski. And so that is a lineage of cellists that I was fortunate to learn from. And so I basically... I got accepted to the New England Conservatory of Music when I was 20. And I basically enjoyed a life of classically trained musician who's going about her 
her life to pretty much go into a, either orchestra career or chamber music career, except when I graduated from the New England Conservatory of Music when I was 23, I was invited to Miami Beach to play with the New Orleans Symphony Orchestra that was a very beautiful um, program for young musicians between college and their intentions for um, professional orchestras to get an opportunity to play with phenomenal conductors and with other phenomenal musicians. And at that time, when I was at the height of my performance career, I also met my spiritual teacher who was with Osho, who was also with Drukshin Rinpoche, who's a phenomenal, beautiful uh, teacher, one of the four lineages of the Tibetan Buddhism. And this is literally the very first week I live in Miami Beach. I meet this gorgeous human being, luminous, luminous, meaning radiant, um, magnetic, beautiful, um, out of out of this world, not mental, not it wasn't something that I could really um, put into words, except I felt a strong connection with, and I, I I was drawn at that moment to connect with his teachings, and so I was playing with a New World Symphony, and at the same time I was also working, or should I say. Um, connecting on a deep level with a beautiful enlightened master. And that moment in my life was basically an opportunity for me to start investigating a little deeper on with, with my consciousness. And that's when I, I feel like my spiritual evolution started around 23 years old. And at the time, um, I basically wanted to explore life a little differently. And I took a little break from the pursuits that I had and went a little bit more inwards, inspired, in, meaning I wanted to relate to who I actually am beyond the identities that I had and went into a very deep, beautiful journey of meditation, of connecting with a beautiful ashram that had um, like um, basically a nonprofit that brought a lot of teachers to help people to connect the dots into their inner being. And so my journey pretty much was in a moment of exploration and evolution in 2006, which is basically six years after I moved to Miami, I find myself getting introduced to music production through a good friend who introduced me to a program called Reason and Pro Tools. And when I discovered that, I basically, in I was like a little girl who's just in a candy store, who all of a sudden has all these toys and all these um, beautiful uh, tools for me to play with and bring my inner world uh, as a musician that's been, you know, very active for many years. But what some was somewhat on a little bit of a break for a little bit, but what like that moment was just so beautiful and so rich that. We wanted, I wanted to, um, I wanted to celebrate it. And so I started producing music at that moment. And um, for the next, what is it now? I'm trying to think, uh, 2006, it's, uh, what is it? 17, 17 years since then, I am in, I basically been in this exploring phase of my life where cre creativity is the main force of um, expression. And I find myself through these years releasing a number of albums where I share my inner experience, my inner dialogue through music, through um, sharing text that was connected to my internal experience and music that was really about healing. It was about experiencing um, the connection of all the dots of my life. As, as a student who was shifting from 
the the journey she thought she was going to or just classical music and a very very particular sort of like image that I had for myself into a much more open much more um almost like the unknown the 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 introduction to the unknown got me more curious about life more curious about um opening myself from a deeper level a deeper space of who I am and that's also connecting the dots to the art of channeling that I tapped back into in 2017 after sitting together with a friend to play and improvise and all of a sudden we're like just composing music on the spot with much ease and grace and that was when I realized that this is me. This is really me, like creating in the moment and being that um, being that creative force that loves to celebrate its creativity. And so today I have a number of albums. I mean, there's, you know, we can um, get into that later, but it's basically the um, intention was to constantly share and enjoy the journey of of uh, creativity and now I have um yeah now it's just all about celebration of that and the art of intimate cello and so yeah there's lots lots and lots and lots of pearls in the way in the in the time of creativity but in a nutshell that is the journey that I I've been through until today Right on. Thank you for sharing that. It's quite, that's quite a, te- a weave of various guidances and inspirations, all rooted in your fundamentals with a very rigorous classical training that led that virtuosic element to your playing mm-hmm. that you bring forth now in many ways. But one of the major channels I gather now is the intimate channel uh, offerings, which we will talk more about, but I understand before we get to that, would you like to share a little sample of this type of music? Sure. Yes. Um, so we're going to be listening to a piece called The Endless Cosmic Sea. And it's part of the album called The Dawn that was released a year ago here in um, Sonoma County, where I currently live. And it's all about tapping in to the channel, tapping into the inner knowing that I can be present and I can enjoy this process of creativity from a space of trust. And so this is the fourth track from the album.
Well, right on. Thank you for sharing that. That was enchantingly beautiful. And, uh, and if I heard you correctly, that was actually the first piece that you recorded under the concept of the intimate cello? Yes, this is from a recording session that was basically the first recording session with Paul Lamb, who is uh, local in Katari. And we sat down with the intention to let it flow. <laughs> and it was all recorded in one take. So what you are hearing now, it's all basically what was created in the moment. <laughs> That's the art. The art is all, it's the rawness of the creativity in the moment and the textures and the orchestration, the imagination, the whole journey of conjuring this experience is all about the internal space. I think that's brilliant. And that's very brave and intimate. And it also, very, I, th I imagine, enhances that connectivity with the listeners. They are right there in the moment of creation, mm -hmm. sharing it, and at least subliminally contributing to it. So the, mm -hmm. that, Absolutely. Barrier, that barrier between the audience and performers sort of drops a little bit. And also salute the bravery, bravery that is that idea of like spontaneous, raw improvisation that's typically not a aspect of the classical training music tradition. Is that fair? Absolutely. So actually, I back to the story of growing up, the, the idea that I was a part of a music department in high school that had improvisation for classical musicians, that was pretty amazing and rare uh, because our teachers were always telling us that they wanted us to have the kind of classes, the fun they always wanted to have and never got to have growing up. So they wanted to create an environment for classical musicians to be able to be a bit more daring, <laughs> have a little bit more fun, you know, and, and just enjoy the journey because it's part of growing up. And in high school age, you know, you're in your teens, that's it. When you start entertaining the idea of wanting to enjoy and actually going for a music career, it has to have an, uh, a space where you really, really like enjoy the you enjoy the space of being in front of an audience in such a way that you have to kind of train yourself how to be present. It's basically like a teaching of um, presence in, in a very young age. So I was very, very lucky to have that because it's quite unusual. And I remember even at the time recognizing that it's pretty unusual. But interestingly for me, I didn't really stay in that um a recognition that that's what I want to do. I just, that was part of my exploration. But later on, like I said, in 2016, 17, that's when I remembered and I was like, ah, yes, that's it. That's me. Right on. So now tell us a little bit more about some of the, the concepts behind the intimate cello work, some of the ideas and musical elements that fuel and give the charge to this music. Sure. Well, first of all, I, as a classically trained musician, I'm used to perform in front of an audience that's very present and very silent. And in my exploration, going into other genres, which is part of uh, my, you know, my flair, my spark, I love to experiment and I love to try things. I've experienced different types of audiences. And um a lot of the time I heard myself say to myself, I really wish to create something where it felt like I could do my thing, which is free and creative and have an audience really present with me. And that was really the seed for the, the intention and the, the vision that I had for Intimate Cello, for the name Intimate Cello. Because it's very much about having this um, precious intimacy with a stranger who's my, who's my fan, my audience, you know, who you, you know, anyone who 
connect to the music gets an opportunity to really receive the intention for the deepest type of connection. And that's what my soul has been craving. And so I basically gave myself permission to create a platform. That's, that's what it's about. And that's what I go for. Yes, that that connection. Randomly, my, my, my mind went to the the documentary of the, the deaf percussionist, Evelyn Glinney, Touch the Sound, which is highly worth looking up for anyone not familiar with, familiar with it, but it was, she was a deaf percussionist and it's all about her world, her perception of sound. And as a world-class you know, performer, percussionist, even though she was deaf, but her, one of her zinger quotes was sound is a form of touch, is that concept of how you create the sound, but touches literally mm -hmm. air molecules bumping and touching the other person and mm -hmm. vice versa. Yeah, I mean, um, so one of the beautiful things that happen a lot of times in my performance experiences is the sense of, uh, it feels like a hypnotic experience where you go into that uh, intention of presence and you connect that also with the space of, um, it's like where we all meet, you know, we meet in the quantum field in a way, but we also have like this um, desire to connect on a soul level. So I always feel this magic it's just it's so magnetic it's 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 hard to describe <laughs> but it's one of those things that i i'm always amazed by in those performances to feel this um electricity and this um hypnotic effect and i bring this topic up cautiously but you have chosen to perform a lot of your newer pieces in that tune to the reference pitch of 432 hertz <laughs> Yes. And that's a big topic that I've been aware of from years for years because it it has very passionate believers in this tuning and equally passionate detractors and critics. And I really don't want to go into the polarity of this versus that, but just want to stick to the topic of like how is it how does it feel to you? How has it inspired you to tap into deeper currents of creativity and expression? Yeah. Great question. Um well, I have a, a very deep connection with my intuition. Um, in fact, I am also a very passionate human design, uh, the human design system. I would say I'm a passionate human who's studying her design. And in my design, I'm very connected to my intuition. That's considered my authority. But uh, Regardless to that, I am always re very tapped into um, in the moment, inner knowing. And so I, my journey of the last three years, let's just say like since the beginning of the pandemic, I was in Los Angeles and I was basically in a space of wow, I really feel called to get a little bit clearer on what I want to do now with my life. Um, and I basically kept asking, you know, for guidance and kept wanting to connect the dots. And I literally manifested some texts and some information that spoke to me so deeply and resonated so deeply that I all of a sudden had this inner knowing that I'm really meant to experiment with this um, tuning system, or should I say it's a harmonic frequency that can be used as a universal A. You can choose your A to be anything you like. It can be 440, 432, it could be 415, you know, it can be, I mean, there's so many different um tuning 444. It really depends on what you want. Um, so I wanted to play with 432 as my concert A and tune all the strings accordingly. It means use my ears 
as well as the math behind it, because you can actually really, you can figure it out. You know, you can, you can hear the intervals. You can tell when they're like, there's a resonance and it basically had the entire cello tuned that way. And that gave me a space for exploration. And I was very curious. So, so another reference to human design, my profile is called the investigator experimenter. And so I have in my personality, this uh, extreme um, need and desire to understand things to the, to the core the foundation of it and so if I'm really interested at something I love to investigate it and I love to try it out and to really feel it for myself and so I did a lot of experimenting between like taking for example a track that I produced in 440 and then I'll process it in audacity to 432 which is fairly high quality processing software um still it it was originally produced in 440 but i could hear more details in 432 and it felt a little bit more like in my body because it was slower it's like you know when you're if you ever experience cannabis it keeps you more present in the moment and so 432 has this ability to keep you more present in the body in my experience. And so I was very interested at that. And I wanted to share this with the world. I wanted to bring it through, you know, live broadcasts and talk to my audience or in front of people to actually bring them to a space where they can tap in to their inner world with this frequency. And one of the things that I'm probably going to start doing is to offer two separate pieces in the same evening that will be tuned differently and see how people will respond to that. But so far, 432 hertz, uh, the tuning of of the cello to 432 hertz is um, inspiring a lot of people to really tap into feeling rather than thinking or rather than processing so you you actually process through the body if anything rather than through the mind and for me i mean i just love the fact that it shows in the golden ratio you know in the in the mathematics of the golden ratio and it it just it's something that i can say from experience and from really wanting to connect the dots, the intention of connecting the dots, um, I really feel uh, a different quality of experience overall. Like there is a deeper connection. People are experiencing this hypnotic deep connection with a vibration that, I mean, it is... (laughs) It's just an experience to really understand this. It's not something that uh, needs to be argued. It's not something that wants to compete. It's not trying to be convincing to anybody. I mean, everybody makes their own choice, right? At the end of the day. Um, But for me, for me, this feels very different when I play in 432 and when I play in 440. I just have a very different experience. Well, thank you for that. Is that, and I love that perspective you kept emphasizing in your experience because in you know four thirty two, there's so many you'll see so many claims and conspiracy theories about it, which should be heard as highly speculative in many cases, to put it as kindly as possible. But all that doesn't matter because the real deal is always in the laboratory of your own mind body experience, mm-hmm. how it makes you feel, and you know that. That's one thing I will even stand by, that that low, slight lowering of the pitch gives it a slight, everything a slightly darker, mellower tone that you can feel. Definitely um, space to explore beyond the mind. <laughs> yeah, but I just have to 
continue that theme. That does not necessarily mean that something is wrong with 440 or that it's bad, but just this is just a can be an interesting alternative yeah. for people to experience and explore. Thanks. Exactly. Why? Um, but not to get back into the head too much. But have you ever heard of the Levitin effect? No, I, I maybe, uh, but remind me, please. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. I, I, it was an obscure fact to it. I actually just ran into over the weekend. But it's a, a little study done by Daniel Levitin, who, among other things, wrote that book, classic book, uh, um, This Is Your Brain on Music. But he was talking about his study of how even non-trained musicians who didn't necessarily have perfect pitch, how with high regularity, they were able to recognize and recall the correct uh, key or original pitch of a piece of music. Mm. So I wonder if that plays into the 432 thing to a degree, because we hear 440 music all the time everywhere. It's like a background noise everywhere. But when you hear that 432, something even subliminally is just, oh, that's slightly different, slightly more relaxing yeah. that might be a factor just thinking out loud interestingly enough i slowed down quite a bit in the last couple of years because i'm literally moved into the forest and so living in the forest allows me to have more pace and space to feel things in general and so I just feel good with 432 because it feels aligned with a slower, more natural pace. And 440 does, it just, it, it's very exciting. And it, it's it's also, it almost like, um, it's hard to, for me to listen to music in 440 and not get in my head. So it's just, you know, it just activates you differently. And um, as, I think it's as long as people are aware, it's all, everything is totally, you know, it, you can deal with anything. And so it's just about balance and awareness, I think. Yeah, it's just a choice on the palette of, because there's so many different approaches to creating therapeutic music and mm -hmm. great music. You know, 432 is just one of them, but it's just an interesting one because it is a, it is a, a lot of awareness and discussion of it these days. Mm -hmm. And that lowering, because for people who really want to go down the rabbit hole, the whole history of the establishment of pitch standards spans centuries, and it's kind of a dramatic mess <laughs> about mm -hmm. how we came to 440. But part of it, I think, if I understood correctly, you may know about, more about this from your studies than I do, <laughs> but there was in like the 1800s-ish, there was like this strange pitch inflation where orchestras kept tuning up because that made things like brighter and more exciting mm -hmm. to the point where someone had to say, dude, so we can't do this anymore. We need to set a pitch that everyone will agree on. So yeah. the 432 is kind of the inverse of that, back to the slowing down in response to modern speediness. Yeah, I mean, again, Everyone needs to go with vibration, with resonance. I, I believe that resonance is the answer to everything. Um, I just personally find it's, uh, it's more liberating to me to have a lot of options in the music industry. And unfortunately, I feel like there is a little bit of a, should I say, it's, it's, created as a universal a it's it's really what it's considered 440 is considered universal a and that means it's an agreement it means it's a, a standard and it means that most people will work with that and it means that most softwares are designed to work with that and it also means that most people are used to that and all that is fine is no there's no problem with it I'm just in, would love to encourage more musicians and more audiences to ask for more variety, you know, like, why not? Yeah. <laughs> and there is variety from my understanding is some orchestras in Europe tune a little higher and some perform, especially for like Baroque music will tune down to maybe even like 415 and there's other major world music traditions that don't use A440 or or 432. Mm -hmm. I love your point. It's just variety and variety of expression and choices to, 
as a listener to appreciate. That's mm -hmm. our message. Mm -hmm. But I imagine you do need to go back and perform in more conventional gigs. Do you, do yeah. you go back to play in A440? Mm -hmm. How does that feel shifting back and forth? Or? I have a great command of um, my ability to be present because I'm practicing that all the time. So I can play beautifully in all tuning systems. Um, and I can go beyond uh, like the different, um, you know, whatever like I am, I'm dealing with, whether it's a recording session for another artist or if I'm uh, performing with somebody and they're preferring to tune that because of their instruments. Um, I'm very, very flexible and I love being flexible. Um, and um, yeah, I don't have necessarily like a an experience of, oh, I didn't like this. They didn't, this didn't feel good. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm I can work with all tuning systems, but my soul prefers 432. That's that's the only difference. Well, that's I love that <laughs> that perspective, just that flexibility and fluidity. Because that's I think one of the lessons of sound. Sound is a fluid flowing art form. We shift frequencies and harmonize with things depending on what else is going on around you. So mm -hmm. there you go, 432, 440, all good. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but another big topic, which we may only have time to really just sort of sketch out, but in addition to tuning notes is another issue in music, the, the whole phenomenon that we are all in the West accustomed to, that equal temperament music because i imagine the cello you have a little more freedom to play have a little bit more different sort of intonation so you're not completely stuck like a piano to the equal tempered pitches any thoughts about that and does that play into your playing at all just having to be you mean to keep it uh the intervals feeling good you mean is that like okay. how you're seeing it I guess the point is on a, on a non-fretted instrument like the cello, you do have a little more flexibility to shade your intonations a little different. Do you ever take advantage of that? Yeah, it's it's so much about um, just hear. You have to hear it in your head before you play it in your hand, um, and so um, there's a lot to do with just very intense listening in the moment and that flexibility you have to have um definitely with a, a cello or a string instrument that has no frets because you don't have any indications that you can use so it's pretty much muscle memory and it's this um you know like you really have to hear it in, in your head yeah yeah, sorry to just drop that bomb. I mean, that was a, a big topic because the whole topic of tunings and temperament in Western music is a massive literature that spanning mm -hmm. centuries because that becomes a conspiracy theory too. People talk about equal temperament and how it's terrible, and, but it's not. It's a miraculous evolution, even though it's a deviation from natural tuning. So, yeah. But before we run out of time, if people would like to connect with you more and find out more about your work, uh, where is the best place to go? So first of all, um, I perform all over the world. Um, I'm invited to perform at different residencies and also at different festivals. So I'm open for invitations to facilitate special containers with just about any um soul that wants to deep to dive and to go deeply into this experience um you can find me online pretty much every two weeks on youtube sharing this specific intention i basically create this uh it's like a there's a theme for every live stream and basically the whole thing is channeled 
So it's a 90 minutes experience where you can come in and you can dive into feeling this tuning system and also feeling the intention for presence with me. And even though it's online, you can get a really good feel for what this experience is about. But having it in the same room is eight times more powerful. Mm. And so that's definitely an invitation where those individuals that are feeling into this and hearing it and getting it and appreciating it to create that experience for themselves and for their friends to experience in real, like in in, in the same space with me um, where I facilitate that. Um, You can also um, connect with me through my social media um, on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook um, under Ruticelli, which is uh, my artist name. I also like to refer people to connect with music that I share on my band camp page, which is an independent platform for artists that want to do things their way, which is kind of hard these days because as I'm sure you all know, um, music streaming has ruined <laughs> has ruined uh, uh, the ability to uh, thrive from uh, you know, from just sharing, um, wanting to share our publications. So it's it's a great tool for promotion, but a lot of artists are now finding independent ways where they can actually share their music on their own platforms. And so you can find a lot of um, exclusive releases on my Bandcamp page that you can um, also, uh, you can pretty much, um, yeah, you, you, you can receive your own uh, individual um, downloads there and they, they won't be available any, anywhere else. So my Bandcamp page is definitely a great place to go. Um, also on my Instagram, there's always my bio on the bio section. You can dive straight into my, currently I have a link to page, which also shows my upcoming performances. And it shows the uh, services of Intimate Cello because Intimate Cello is offered for individuals, for couples, for the community. Um, I also have performers I collaborate with and they perform with me in 432 hertz like an all improvised material where I basically take the lead and uh, also I don't think I mentioned before and you might be interested to know so all the music when it's composed on the spot I use tools for that I have actual um, my toys are my looper and I have a delay machine and I, um, I have also some other effects like um, swift, uh, sweep effect and some cool uh, chorus and, and reverb and distortions and, you know, intervals and stuff like that. It's just my, my fun, uh, you know, toys. <laughs> um, and so I compose everything on these machines. And um, people that I perform with are basically connecting to my loops. And so together we orchestrate the entire experience. And it's very special because those experiences, they go, they can take an audience to so many different states. It can take an audience to a state of... um, just really enjoying the moment in whether it's like a social experience or, um, you know, like a party where people want to maybe lay down for a bit and connect with their friends. You know, like a lot of times I'm invited to parties like that, where there'll be different either performers or different uh, 
parts of the night and then intimate cello takes everybody into the deeper state of the night where we dive into our subconscious basically <laughs> and uh, it's something that i wanted to mention definitely that um this experience is has such beautiful potential to help us all to tap into our highest purpose in life. And I'll I'll drop a little hint also for in the future, I intend to uh, weave a little bit of human design with this because I have a great passion for this system. And this system is here to help us tap into our highest potential and our soul's purpose. And so this is the direction where Intimate Cello is moving forward. And we're really calling for connecting with community on how can we serve each individual to really tap into their highest whole purpose from a space of unconditional love. And working with the sound vibration help us to connect these dots. And I open the container every time when I host these containers, after the deep dive, after we go into like three or four pieces back to back, we come back from the experience, which is very hypnotizing. And we bring everybody into the room, into connecting the dots. And so everybody starts sharing, which is really, really magical. Um, and in this sharing experience, a lot of people recognize that um, there's a lot that they appreciate about presence and about being able to connect so deeply with the intention of intimacy with the intention of being present with wanting to be so devoted to presence that I bring into into it and so people really open their hearts and it's just magical to witness what happens so I just wanted to bring that up because this is something really precious to to share with different audiences and it suits so many different types of containers and it is um something that i can see in a lot of different retreats and it's in a lot of different um experiences where large companies are connecting the dots to their interrelationships interpersonal connections and human design already works with that we're already seeing a lot of beautiful um or uh, institutions that are evolving with it and so this is a direction so i'm i'm giving you a little bit of a taste uh, with uh you know the freedom of expansion and what it allows and what we can explore together well, that's a brilliant vision. Thank you for that. So I think that's just very valuable medicine for these times, these enhanced sense connections between community and one-on-one -on -one and in more collective community settings. So a beautiful mission. Thank you. But on that note, I think that may be the note that we sound the Ting Shaws on here for our set, <laughs> for our talk today. So We'll just leave it at that. Encourage people to find their way to your main site linked below, rudycelli.com and, and the YouTube. It, it, there is a wealth of brilliant material there, as I was saying earlier, mm -hmm. live performances and recording, beautifully filmed and beautifully recorded, enchantingly beautiful sounds. So encourage people to find their way there too. And Indeed. on that note, Rudy, thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for this beautiful invitation. And I'm looking forward to connecting the dots. <laughs> connecting the dots. Yes, I love it. Well, right on. Thank you again. And once again, we'd like to thank the Shift Network for providing this platform for these journeys on the sound current. And most importantly, thank you to everyone out there listening. You are appreciated. Thank you for being here and I invite you to come on back because there's more to come here on the Shift Network Sound Healing Summit, and we'll see you next time.